Hello, my name is Guy Moxie from Wall Speed Power and welcome to In The Studio. We're here really to chat about silicon carbide, talk through all things sick, crush some myths, put some fake news to bed, just have damn good chats about silicon carbide. And to do this, I'm with actually someone pretty special. This gentleman, 34 years ago in 1987, with a group of friends, formed a wide bang gap company. Just to give you context, 34 years ago, I was in 10th grade. And the biggest thing on my mind was a really bad 80s mullet hairdo. So this gentleman was 30 years ahead of the curve. Welcome, Mr. John Palmer. Thank you. Good to be here. Pleasure. You and I have done a fair few panels and conferences and webinars a lot more recently. A question that comes up over and over again is sick versus GAN versus silicon. Yep, I've been, been having that debate for about 14 years now. Yeah, and it's, I don't think it's like a man versus food type thing or lion versus tiger. I, you know, back in the UK, we have this phrase horses for courses. And it's pretty damn true, you know, if you're gonna run a race, if you're gonna run a, 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 you know, the Grand National, you don't pile up with the draft horse. You know, if Prince Charles invites you to play a spot of polo with him, you don't pile up with a race horse. And I think it's the same with the three technologies. There's the right technology for the right type of application and an end system. Yep. They each have their places. They do, absolutely. And, you know, silicon is this huge entrenched gorilla why Bang Gap is really, you know, come into its, its own in the last real decade. You know, GAN coming more recently. And so how in your mind, JP, from a device level, do they stack up against each other? Well, first I was going to say that uh, if you're in wide band gap, either silicon carbide or gallium nitride, the real, you know, beast you're trying to defeat is silicon. It is the dominant power semiconductor still. But both technologies have significant advantages in terms of operating frequency and efficiencies, and they are making inroads. Where silicon carbide really excels is probably in the one kilowatt and up uh, range. Higher power. Higher, Higher power, power. Relatively speaking. Um, because it's, it's very rugged, it's easy to parallel, it's easy to put into power modules. It's very similar to silicon in yeah. terms of your ability to, to get a high amperage package. Gallium nitride to date has had most of its success actually at lower voltages, below 650 volts, and, uh, and then at 650 volts in the charger market. Now those are only maybe 100 watts or so. So, so these are devices that are in charging. a couple of, Yeah, computer yeah, okay. chargers, uh, phone chargers, multi-purpose chargers. Yeah. And it's very nice because you can make these chargers very small and compact. Um, but the power level is, is quite low, 100 yeah. amps. So um, where we really start is about one kilowatt and up. And our ability to parallel in power modules takes us all up into the multi hundreds of kilowatts, if not uh, megawatts. Yeah, so we can see, you know, the slide showing the landscape today with, especially with silicon carbide coming in at 650 volts. Prior to that, it was 1200 volts, 900 volts. Yep. 650 volts brings it down and takes this big chunk out of that, I'm not saying consumer, but you know, that, that under three kilowatt, two kilowatt, one kilowatt, you know, I agree silicon carbide kind of gets out of bed at a kilowatt. Yep. It could be used at low power. Well, it is in, yeah. in some, but the bulk of the market is really kind of one kilowatt and above. And that would be things like uh, uh, switch mode power supplies for servers, um, where they love the silicon carbide because of the ability to make the um, power supply, I would say, more powerful in the same size box yeah. uh, as you're driving um, server power up and up and up yeah. you know, for data centers. That's right. And, and on the switching frequency side of things, you mentioned it already. You know, it's interesting, I come from an apps background, so when I look at switching frequency, yeah, theoretically you could switch at megahertz. Mm -hmm. Depends on your losses. Yep. But, you know, EMI, shielding, other factors actually mean sometimes you can't. Yeah, there's, I would say above several hundred kilohertz, there's a lot of practical reasons, you know, that, that limit your frequency above that because of the EMI and, and things. And there are some uh, nichier applications that go up, you know, into the megahertz range. And we are in some um, using uh, soft switching, but the, the bulk of the market is, 
is going to be in the low hundreds of, of kilohertz for that's for the switch mode power supply applications. On the power side, I mean, you know, we do probably as much or more GAN than anyone else, but we do it we for something high, different, don't we? We are a high volume manufacturer of gallium nitride, and uh, we've we've made probably more GAN FETs than than anyone or GAN HEMS. Yeah. But we choose to focus on the RF market, um, which is a lower voltage device where GAN is very effective. Like 30, um, 40, 50 volts sort of range? Yeah, it's like a 50 volt bias. And um, so you, it's there's very little penalty to over design for that voltage because gallium nitride can't avalanche. So, you know, we, we build in a lot of margin on the voltage. You have a uh, extremely high um, channel mobility, carrier yeah. mobility uh, with the hemp structure. And so it's very easy to operate up into the gigahertz range. Well, that's a that's an RF frequency, not a power frequency. Absolutely, yeah. And um, it's really revolutionizing um, telecom infrastructure from the ability to do very high data rate 4G LTE and uh, an upcoming 5G. 5G. So uh, gamma nitride has been very very successful in the RF market. But when it comes to power, we choose to focus on the silicon carbide because it's just far more rugged. Uh, for high power applications. Yeah, and, and again, horses for courses. I've seen some really tasty looking gun at 40 volt to 200 volt, where yep. they've stripped it right back and made it chip scale to get rid of the packaging. Yep. Uh, monolithically integrated switches and drivers yep. together. But again, it's mostly sort of, it's certainly voltage limited and, and current ampacity limited too. Yeah, and I think the, the integrated driver with the chip is an excellent use of gallium nitride yeah. because, as I said, um, we focus on silicon carbide because it's very, very rugged. Um, gallium nitride is notoriously not rugged uh, and so because you, you can't avalanche, you have to build in a lot of margin for voltage. Um, so there's, there's uh, one of the companies that in fact does an integrated driver uh, with the, the hemp, the power device, uh, their advertisement is discrete GAN mm -hmm. is unprotected GAN. So a big part of yeah. their cell is reliability because they're putting the protection circuitry right there on the chip. But it's also an acknowledgement of the lack of uh, ruggedness of the GAN device. I mean, I, 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 I remember a GAN forum where someone from the GAN community basically said GAN is, is, is as robust as a stick insect. <laughs> so I, I, I wasn't going to disagree. I not heard that. I wasn't going to disagree. but. Let's talk about voltage as well. Yep. You know, applications tend to di dictate voltages. We see silicon carbide, of course, getting in A1 into 1200 volts solar, 1500 volt panels, 800 volt batteries for EV vehicles, etc. So there's that sort of 650 volt crossover area where we wake up in silicon carbide and GAN yeah. kind of stops. Well, so the, the, the reason we don't focus below 650 volts is at 650 volts, we're dominated by a lot of other parasitic resistances. So we're not even close to the um, theoretical unresistance of the device. Okay. So if we go lower in voltage, it's not gonna get a lot cheaper or, or less resistive. Yeah. Um, we're sort of asymptoting in that uh, uh, regime. Um, so below 650 volts, I think GAN is a, an excellent uh, alternative to silicon. Um, by the same token, when we go from 650 volts to 1200 volts, the own resistance doesn't increase very much. Yeah. So there's actually not much penalty to be paid by going to the higher voltage, whereas in gallium nitride, your device gets much larger um, as you go up in voltage. And really, you know, above 650 volts, it's not that you can't make a gallium nitride device, but the chip size gets to be very, very large to block that voltage because yeah. it's a lateral device. So your voltage is dictated by the gate to drain gap. Yep. So if you want to block more voltage, you have to make that gap bigger. That means a bigger die size. And because the device can't avalanche, you have to go that much even further. Um, to, you, and you all have this to is adding real estate. This is all comes out of real estate. And so what's real estate mean? Cost. It means cost. Yeah, exactly. So we talked about RDS on a couple of times, we've mentioned it. And that's a particular thing I've noticed with silicon carbide actually very much our silicon carbide actually it's that flatness of rds on over temperature mm -hmm. you know a data sheet value sticker price 25 degrees c boom but with with silicon carbide as you move into actually where you use the device in a system 125 135 degrees c even though 
its junction can go up to 175. At usable temperatures, just a little nose below that. We see that RDS on increase by 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 times over temperature, whereas our, our friends in GAN and silicon, of course, MOSFETs, increase a lot more than that. And the slide behind us shows that dramatic difference in RDS on over temperature. Yep. So silicon carbide has offsetting factors as you go up in temperature. Our channel mobility gets better with increasing temperature as our drain resistance or electron mobility goes down and they sort of offset each other. So yes, depending on the voltage of the device, their own resistance may only go up by 30 to 50% between room temp and 150C. Um, in gallium nitride and silicon, it goes up more like by a factor of two to two and a half. It can do, yeah. So any system designer has to design their system around the maximum temperature. So yeah. as you said, 135, more likely like 150 degrees C. Um, and what that means is you can't compare similar um, room temp on resistances between silicon carbide and gallium nitride because, um, because the designer actually cares about what it's gonna be the own resistance at, uh, at 150C, say. If you're comparing against a 60 milliohm silicon carbide MOSFET, you're gonna have to use about a 40 milliohm, a larger gallium nitride chip, in order to get the same performance yeah. at uh, high temperature. So whereas 60 milliohm might only go up to, to, you know, by 30 or 40%, they're gonna go up by two and a half. So you can never compare pricing like for like uh, you know, for, for similar uh, owner resistance devices, because our, our convention is to um, rate the owner resistance at room temperature. That's just the convention. In the Always has been, isn't it? Always yes. has been. Um, but that's not really the magic number. You, you really need to have a uh, significantly lower owner resistance device in GAN so that you can match uh, the on resistance at high temp. Yeah, so you just, you know, comparing like for like data sheets is actually incorrect. You've got to look yes. down in those details and look exactly where the operating temperature is. And, you know, as you can see from the figure behind us, you know, so we can use a, a lesser rated device compared to silicon or GAN. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing, and this is one of the myths of gallium nitride, is that it's cheaper than silicon carbide. Um, you know, the tagline a long time ago was, you know, uh, silicon carbide performance at silicon pricing. But if you just go look like for like uh, in a distributor catalog, and these, you know, prices move up and down, it's a spot market, but uh, in general, the gallium nitride is quite a bit uh, more expensive. And particularly if you're looking at the, the high temp on resistance and you compare, silicon carbide is in the range of about 30% less expensive than gallium nitride. So about using the different, the three different technologies, I mean, silicon covers five volts to 15, 50 kV, does everything. It's kind of a one sneaker fits all type of approach in my mind. It does everything okay. Then you have the wide band gap coming in and, you know, in both of our views with GAN, it's 650 volt and below, particularly 40 to 200 volt, high frequency where you can, yep. um, lower power. Silicon carbide you know, wakes up and gets out of bed at 650 volt all the way up to, I know you're working in... Uh, we've made MOSFETs up to 10 uh, kV and IGBTs up in the 20 kilovolt range. Yeah, so it spans all the way up there. And I think hopefully we'll have a little chat about some of the uh, the mid voltage applications in a, in a different session. Would love to. But, you know, it's all about using it. And you know, I get this question a lot coming from an apps background is, oh, no, you know, how do you use silicon carbide? How do you use GAN? But in reality, if you can drive a car, it's the same thing. OK, the sports cars, there's SUVs. And I jump out of my Toyota Highlander, big lump of, you know, metal and jump in some sports car. I know how to drive it. I may, if I put my foot flat on the floor, I may have a bit of a bit of a wobble here and there. But the principles are the same. Do you see any? Do you see any different principles in using this stuff? Uh, with silicon carbide, no. Uh, it is a MOSFET. You know, it's it's normally off. Uh, we use a, a, a 
drive voltage of 15 volts, yeah. but it looks and acts very much like a silicon MOSFET or a silicon IGBT. Just a bit faster. Just faster. Yeah. And that's really the, the thing you have to pay attention to is, is how you drive it. Um, you know, the speed, uh, the driver, the position of, of the driver. You've got to get that close and reduce inductances. Um, but it acts very much like a silicon switch. Um, gallium nitride, there's, there's different types of uh, devices on the market. Some of them are depletion mode, so they're normally on. And at, okay. at VG yeah. equals zero, and you have to, to cut them off. Uh, the typical solution to that would be to do a cast code configuration, yeah. which is pretty good for a soft switched application, well, but, but quite difficult if you're doing a hard switched application like a, a motor drive, an inverter. Yeah, so there's some awkwardness around the GAN. Yeah. And then there is also enhancement mode. There's, there are some normally off uh, gallium nitride devices, mm -hmm. but uh, their threshold voltage is quite low. So you still have to be quite careful about how. And then you, you got to be careful because you know spurious turn on can be a problem. Exactly. So, but again, silicon carbide. If you can handle that using the car analogy, the acceleration and the and the pretty severe braking mm -hmm. on and offs, you're going to be okay. Nothing to be scared of. I would say the thing we've spent a lot of time on is um, optimizing the power module design to get everything we can get out of silicon carbide yeah. because you can drop it in a standard silicon module and you'll get an advantage. That's right. But yeah. the you know the typical silicon power module designs have a lot of uh, uh, loop inductance that limit your ability to extract the value. So we, we've we also done a lot of work on the, the module, power module design uh, to reduce those inductances and try to get the most value you can out of the silicon carbide. So with the water speed power modules, we've done a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Exactly. And Done that, good deal. That That's should really make you know, the ability to use it much easier. So we've talked about performances, technologies, application placements, but there's always that still, that same question still comes up that, you know, I've been using IGBT for the last 42 years. Why should I use some of this newfangled silicon carbide stuff? What do we say there? And it's, it's always been that way with silicon carbide. I think, thankfully, because I've been in this a long time, that story is changing quite a bit because it is a conservative industry, hmm. but um, and people, you know, kind of come in with the attitude, you, I ne "I'll never get fired doing the same thing," you know, I've always done. Yeah, yeah. Um, the but, IBM analogy from years ago: never yeah. get fired for using IBM. Yeah. But once you know one of their competitors does adopt it, when you get the early adopters, and they get to see the system level advantages, well, things start to change pretty quickly. We saw that in solar inverters, we saw that in uh, switch mode power supplies, and we're seeing that play out now in uh, automotive inverters. Almost every automotive OEM is looking at silicon carbide for future battery electric vehicle uh, inverter drives. Yeah, and it's good to see. And I understand that, you know, you don't have a seasonal rush on welding machines. Yep. There's not a new model every year and design cycles are slow, but you know, that designer in welding machines, just a generic example, yeah, he's been using IGBT for the last 42 years, but he's evolved along generations of IGBT. He's not using the same product that he did 42 years ago. So he's, you know, they evolve and envelop change. Absolutely. And Silicon we, never sleeps. Yeah, big time it doesn't. And yeah. it's 20 billion odd dollars of, of market. And we go out of our way to make it easier for people to understand what our stuff's about. Yeah. Demo boards, reference designs, hardware simulation, you know, simulate twice, design once, the old saying. So we're trying to knock down all of those barriers for adoption. Well, and it's, it's funny, you mentioned the welding application. Well, those are generally portable and size matters yeah. um, because it's, it's, you know, if it's big and heavy, it's awkward to carry around. So there has been traction uh, for silicon carbide in welding markets, um, portable power for, um, you know, driving uh, job site tools and things like that. Yes, yeah. So uh, the, th the places where they can really take advantage of the size and weight reduction that silicon carbide allows, they are waking up to the benefits that silicon yeah. carbide brings. There's no, I mean, it's all, it's all about the factors and silicon carbide's gonna be more efficient. Yep. It's gonna let out less heat, smaller cooling. So there's no doubting that, but silicon that, you know, is, is so entrenched that yeah, when it looks at regulations, portability, 
ruggedness, et cetera, then all those factors come in. And, you know, could you honestly believe 30 odd years ago, um, you know, that the silicon carbide market could be as big as they're saying today. There was a report out last, just last week, saying by 2030, which is not that far away, no. it could be 40 odd billion dollars as a market for silicon carbide. I would not have believed that number uh, because a, a lot of that is driven by markets that didn't exist 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, but did I believe silicon carbide could be a major player in the power semiconductor industry? Absolutely yeah. uh, believed that. But some of the new applications uh, and the, I'll call it the electrification of the world, uh, we didn't see that coming. Um, so it's, it's fortuitous. It's coming at a time when silicon carbide is maturing to help meet those needs. Yeah. And as our CEO, Greg Lowe says, this is a multi-decade opportunity. It's not just a, an ultra-portable trend for today. Yeah. Because once we clean up the electric vehicles, then we've got to make sure the charging of those is more efficient. And then the energy generated for that is more efficient. And the then the distribution of that, of that it's just yeah. ongoing. It's incredible. And one thing, though, comes up a lot is we're talking about these general questions, is we briefly touched about ruggedness and quality and reliability, but it's that long-term reliability. Yep. Again, this is not a $29 piece of consumer throwaway equipment. If you're gonna put silicon carbide into planes, trains, cars, windmills, it's gotta have that longevity and long-term reliability. And you know, you've been in it 30 odd years, but yep. commercially silicon carbide hasn't had those six or seven decades like silicon has to prove itself. But right now we're clocking, I think you guys, your team did the, the, the latest results. It's just over seven trillion yep. field hours of product, our product out there in the market today. Seven yep. trillion hours. So we, we have you know, been selling power devices in silicon carbide for about 20 years. And uh, we've sold a lot of devices over the year. The, you know, the, the, that time span. And yeah, the, the, there's a lot of field hours out there, a ton. Yeah. And the answer is it's quite reliable. It's very reliable. In the case of uh, Shockey diodes, they're actually more reliable than the silicon PN diodes that we were replacing. Yeah, the figures show the fit rates are, are more reliable. Yeah. And as we're moving into this automotive market, you know, the bar gets that even, you know, set even higher. Um, because it's, and there it's not a question. It's really no longer a question of, does it have good reliability? It comes down more to quality, which is what's your, not parts per million failure rate, parts per billion, billion. failure rate. Yeah, um, yeah. we're because, talking billions and trillions here. Yeah, there's Big a numbers. lot of chips in an inverter and you know the, the numbers multiply pretty rapidly. So you've, you've got to have extremely good uh, quality control you know, to get down to that PPB range. Yeah. Um, and all other markets, you know, will will uh, benefit from that. Yeah. So it's it's very rugged, it's very reliable. Which is, you know, the, the third biggest barrier to entry. And, and of course, availability. We, we go through market cycles where there's, there's supply and then there's lack of supply, depends on, on the time of, of the situation. But yeah. let's talk about you know, planning for supply. $40 billion potentially as yep. a market, that's gonna be a lot of silicon carbide. Massive increase yeah. in capacity that will be required. Not just capacity, but also manufacturing efficiencies. But um, yes, the, the advent of the automotive market is, is gonna be so huge um, and, and certainly every automotive OEM today is very, very concerned about assurance of supply. As they it's one of the be. hot button yeah. issues oh, of yeah. the last year, yeah. and, and it's gonna continue for a while. So we're, we're trying to get ahead of that curve. We're building a um, huge new uh, fab up in uh, New York, mm -hmm. uh, the Mohawk Valley yeah. uh, fab, and we're gonna be opening that on uh, 200 millimeter wafers. So it's gonna be the 200. first. 200 millimeter. Exclusively. 200. Exclusively 200 millimeter. It's gonna be the first 200 millimeter fab on, in the world. Uh -huh. And it's gonna be a huge leap in device capacity from where we're at today. Um, we're also expanding our facility here in Durham, North Carolina, 
um, for the large volume of wafers and you know, substrates and epi that are going to be required to feed that market. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the markets, that's just the beginning. There will be a lot more. Yeah, there's got to be. There has to be. So we talked difference in technologies. We talked some applications that are enabled. We we're aware of what GAN's doing and what Silicon is doing. So let's just finish off on, on the cost question. Yes. And you said it, you know, the, the original GAN tagline was better performance than silicon at a lower cost, implying that silicon carbide was just going to be off the reservation somewhere, you know, but look at the facts, look at the sticker prices. This is sticker prices, it's a hundred of, so we all know that if you buy multi-millions, it would be different, but just look what it shows. It shows not only is silicon car GAN and silicon, not in the right context, but silicon carbide is, is the best performing. We talked about RDS on over temperature. You can see the hot and the cold temperatures yep. at the most cost effective price. Absolutely. The thing that most people miss, you know, the, the, the promotion you usually hear is that GAN on silicon, a GAN on silicon wafer is much cheaper than a silicon carbide wafer. Fine. Let, that's, let's say that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the number I've heard is uh, a silicon carbide wafer, with a 150 millimeter silicon carbide wafer uh, with epitaxy is 2.5x the cost 2. of GAN epitaxy on a, on a six inch silicon wafer. Mm -hmm. um, great, let's take that. Silicon carbide gets about three times more amps per wafer than gallium nitride yeah. because of those issues with having to design in all that extra voltage which all comes laterally, it's chip size. Um, the chip sizes for gallium nitride for a decent sized power device are far larger. And um, so in terms of room temperature amps, we get about three times more uh, per wafer. If you wanna look at the usable amps at temperature as we talked about, mm -hmm. it's actually between four to five times more usable amps at 135 or 150 C than uh, GAN on silicon, but it's only 2.5x the price. Yeah. So you tell me which one is pretty cheaper. Pretty simple to work through. Uh, we do a lot of hard things in this industry, but math is not one of them. And that, as you said, is 150 millimeter. That's 150 in, millimeter. In, in the very near future, 200 millimeter is where the, the, the battle's gonna be won. Yeah, and you know, could GAN go to uh, 200 millimeters? Yes, it could. Um, I will stress that the uh, epitaxy to, to do those two dissimilar materials, you know, GAN on silicon, gets more complicated so that you don't have warping, cracking, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, let's assume they can go to 200 millimeter. We are on our way to 200 millimeter right now, so the math still holds. Yeah, we're touching it. We're touching it right now. We get gallium nitride performance at silicon carbide prices. There you go. So, so John, thanks for joining us today. Glad to do it. Well, I think we've talked some really good stuff about silicon carbide, particularly SIC versus GAN versus silicon. Uh, most of the stuff we talked about is on our website, and people can go, and if they have any further questions, go and find out. And I hope you join us again on another canter through the conversation of uh, silicon carbide in, in the studio. <laughs>